We're all talking about it, have it, or know someone with this disorder. Research shows almost 300,000 of us may have ADHD. But why is it so hard and so expensive to diagnose? Tonight, Jill Higgins meets the doctor who broke the rules of a system he says is broken, a doctor who now faces losing his career. Now, warning, this story deals with difficult themes. Different people, different walks of life, but a feeling of being different, that is something they all share. I definitely process and experience the world differently to everyone else. They all have ADHD. I liken it to if you had a picture made of glass and you put a big nail in the middle and kind of went like that on it and it just cracks it, that's my brain. Distractions, noise, inner thoughts all colliding. My, my, my mum would call me a walking time bomb. I was having panic attacks and they were really frightening. So if you were just going to wait on the public system... She said two years, two years minimum. I mean, she gonna suck, right? So why is it so hard to get help? Uh, I needed help, I didn't ask for it, I didn't know there was help. The current system for managing ADHD is broken. And why is this GP facing the end of his career for trying to fix it? You were willing to risk everything? Yes. And I swore when I first became a, a doctor that, that my, I would look after my patients the very best I could. We first met Dr Tony Han last year in the grounds of his practice in East Auckland. He's a little older than your average family GP. So you are, you know, the fine age of 86 now? Yes, that's right. <laughs> Why do, would you want to keep working? Because I love what I do and I, I believe it's, it matters, it makes a difference. Dr Han set up his general practice here in 1967. It was only in the 90s that he became aware of ADHD. He made it his mission to become New Zealand's leading expert. I was given the job of writing the guidelines. <laughs> so I did, and they were approved, and as far as I know, they've never been replaced since. He's certainly widely recognised, still is recognised as being the leader in this, in this field. His son Nick remembers his dad's passion. Probably upwards of 5,000 people uh, that he's directly helped. ADHD or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder is commonly linked to hyperactivity in young males. But in adults and women, it's mostly challenges with focus and being impulsive. Many people have some symptoms. It's when they continually disrupt your life that help is needed. Well, the, the point of there being consequences in a job loss or marriage loss or, or being locked up. Um, drug use, of course, was a big one. In the 90s, there were no barriers to GPs treating ADHD. Dr Han could prescribe a stimulant like Ritalin, or he could organise counselling. I always emphasise it's not just a matter of taking the pills. And what kind of changes do you see? Well, huge. But you see people who, who are, are now confident to face the world, to face life. It's absolutely amazing. But at the end of that decade, a surge in cases in the US sparked fears stimulant use would get out of control. The bureaucracy began <laughs> to make it harder and harder and harder. Dr. Han could diagnose anxiety and depression, but no longer ADHD, unless he found a psychiatrist to supervise. Dr. Alan Taylor, who specialised in ADHD, agreed, allowing Dr. Han to keep treating patients for years. Not only took their history, he would have them do various tests, questionnaires, a computer test for attention. Dr. Han saw he could address a serious need. The chances of spending a night in jail are 22 times greater if you have ADHD. He met Marsh through a drug rehab program, then later identified he had ADHD. I would just turn up there and, and like, um, 
he'll make room for me. He took no money from me whatsoever. Great to see you again. Good to see you, Tony. Yeah. With a background of drugs and violence, it might be easy to think Marsh was beyond help. Thank you. But talking continues to help. Violence, violence was a big part of it. Mm. So someone would say something and the thoughts in my head, mm. and no, you know, because it would just keep going over and over in my head. And then and I've spent 26 years of my life in jail, over 20, let's say half of my life. You know, having known you quite a long time, there's been a huge change, huge improvement in your life. There has been. Well, I won't give up on you. Thank you, Tony. From a life of endless trouble, the support and medication have put Marsh on the right track. Within two months, I had a licence, I had a bank card, I had a car, and I was living back in Oraki. I'm home. <laughs> I look like I look at my dog. <laughs> And you know, um, I actually, I actually, I actually love Dr. Han. You know, I believe that if it wasn't for him, I would, I would be back in jail. <laughs> in Papamoa Bay of Plenty, Catherine Sylvester's life is very different. She has a nice house, husband, two great kids. Instagram perfect. And I look at my old Instagram. I'm smiling in them. I'm smiling, you know. But there is so much a camera can't reveal. It was, that's the abs, hands down darkest time in my life. I felt like nothing was gonna help. ADHD in adults, especially women, hasn't been well understood. When your kids were young, my kids were young, and we were just like trying to figure out why something that like was so easy for everyone else just felt so hard. Catherine can now see there were warning signs as a teenager. E eating issues, uh, yeah, drinking more, partying more, a, a really a great deal of that was self-medicating. Antidepressants didn't help. But recognising ADHD-type symptoms in her 20s, she went to see a psychiatrist. He said, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with you. I think this is a normal person's mood range. This is yours. She muddled through for a decade until she became a mum. I literally didn't know where to start. The self-narrative of that is you suck. You know, you can't even be on time, be organised, vacuum the floor, pick up the toys. So I would have a Red Bull and have another Red Bull. I had eight Red Bulls a day and a lot of chocolate. And then I put on a lot of weight and then I felt really bad about myself. I felt afraid for my kids. What if I just lost it and left? You know, what, you know, when every day is that hard. The idea of ADHD came up again with a counsellor, but this time she was recommended Dr Han. So that diagnosis from Dr Han, what difference did that make to you? Night and day. It was life-saving. It was like, yes, that makes sense. I make sense, and I can do something about it. She was given a prescription. First day I took meds. I sat down with, my daughter would have been two, my youngest. I cried because I was interested in what we were doing. Now, she only takes meds on the days she needs them. It's like last year, I worked full time in a management position. I completed my postgraduate diploma. I managed my kids' lives, and I came out of it in one piece. There's just no way I could have done that without treatment. Like Catherine, many desperate patients came to this waiting room to see Dr Han. The waiting room would be filled with people. But that lifeline was about to be put at risk. I mean, I knew it was coming. His supervising psychiatrist retired. He was 85. And I wrote to the Ministry of Health. I said, you know, I've got all these ADHD patients who are settled on medication. Can you, can you provide me with somebody? Silence. But Dr Han wouldn't keep quiet. He wrote again. He said, I'm going to do this in my own name. And I did. You knew that it was 
a great risk yes. for you. Yes. It's the weekend in Mount Monganui. Much needed time out for GP Dr. Luke Bradford. He's frustrated. Oh, well, I have patients phone me up on a Friday night in tears because of the way their brains work and they can't afford to go and get help. We get frustrated by those patients who we've tried on antidepressants and anti-anxieties and are now drinking too much or smoking cannabis when we know that their diagnosis is ADHD. He understands Dr. Han wanting change, but as medical director of the College of GPs, he doesn't support how Dr. Han tried to get it. Because otherwise we are gonna have cowboy operators go out there and, and pick and choose which rules they decide to stick to. Does that mean the regulations were right? No. The regulations are stupid. Dr. Han knew he was breaking the rules and others started to notice too. They were all asking, you know, what's, what's going on here, what's going on? Then, an official complaint. The first one was a pharmacist who um, complained to the Ministry of Health, saying, we've got this prescription, but you haven't got the psychiatrist's approval. And then finally, in 2018, there's this ultimatum from the Medical Council, you know, and they said to my father, you either stop now, or you face the repercussions. We're in Wellington with 26-year-old Jessie. She's paying to see a private psychiatrist about ADHD. I've had to save up a whole bunch of money to be able to do it, but I know people can't even do that. It's pretty cool. Even going <laughs> private, she's been on the wait list for two years. Mind you, She's been desperate for help her whole life. It was just like a lot of self-doubt from like a really, really young age, crippling self-esteem issues. It's just like my brain just couldn't turn off. Oh my God. And I tried medication. I was on antidepressants from, I think in my last year of high school and tried a whole bunch. None ever worked. They've been telling signs. Changed my degree many times. Um, How many times? Three. <laughs> um, there was counselling at uni. And was ADHD ever mentioned in any of those Never. sessions? Never. And that's despite serious cries for help. And I just went down this really dark, like suicidal rabbit hole for a bit um, and tried to end my life a few times. ADHD isn't considered an emergency, but it can feel urgent to those who have it. I don't know, I feel like just with my living experience with my mental health and the fact that I might not be here to this day, I feel like it is a bit of an issue, to be honest. Sorry, that's very blunt. <laughs> but you've got to be blunt. Yeah. It's the day of her appointment. Jess is anxious about what lies ahead and what that could mean. Are you, like, worried that, like, you might go for this appointment and they might come out and be like, this isn't ADHD. There is like a, yeah, there's definitely a bit of a fear in the back that that could be the case. Her journey in gives her plenty of time to think. Kind of nervous now, yeah. Sinking in, basically. I had a bit of a reflection on the bus ride here about, I don't know, I guess my whole life. I'm actually gonna start going. Jess is in there for over an hour. So I pass with flying colours. She said there's a 99% probability I have ADHD and I got 18 out of 18 symptoms. Now Jessie can put her past behind her. Life has been so rough for no reason in certain ways because of it. She's been given the confidence to enrol to study law next year. The world's my oyster and it always was. It's like I can actually do it now. It was, it was fundamentally life-changing. My generation and the generation... Green Party co-leader Chloe Swarbrick says her diagnosis eight years ago allowed her to be where she is now. It allowed me to reorient my sense of self. She's always looked like a great success, but there have been years of hidden struggle that started early. 
the wheels started falling off a little bit as I got into my teenage years and my brain not working in the way that I guess suppose other people's did. Drinking to excess, uh, to just I guess try and quiet my head. Doctors confirmed it was ADHD. And I understand that all of this can kind of sound like an excuse, but the reality is that for somebody who has a brain like mine, uh, that those things are a little bit harder. Chloe's helping to drive change. We have now a system which is just massively out of date. So we pulled together with ADHD and Z, uh, the Royal Colleges of Psychiatrists, Psychologists, Pediatricians, the police came, um, we had Pharmac there, Te Whatuoro, the Ministry of Health, uh, and got, I believe, five to six commitments around necessary changes to improve access. Oh, yeah. Including a bigger role for family GPs. College of GPs medical director Dr Bradford says most doctors welcome the idea of select GPs getting specialist training. It would be a win for patients because they'd have access to quicker and more affordable diagnosis. It would be a win to society because we'd see less burdens on the education system, on the benefit system and on the prison service. There's huge support for it, but the wait continues. So what kind of time frame are we talking about? Well, I'm not in charge, <laughs> but if I were, it would happen tomorrow. The Minister of Mental Health, Matt Ducey, can push things through. He declined our interview, but said in a statement, we will need to balance moving quickly with ensuring patient safety. Making care more accessible was Dr Han's ultimate goal. His lawyer argued his case before the tribunal. Everybody who gave evidence, including the ministry and Pharmac witnesses, acknowledged the system is broken. In the UK and in Canada, it's very different. Health, health practitioners, not just doctors, nurses in the UK can write prescriptions for the, this medication. But the prosecution was unmoved. Dr Hahn prescribed Class B controlled drugs without following the law. They've described me as a liar and a cheat. And nothing could be further from the truth. Now his fate has been decided. One year suspension, a three year ban on prescribing stimulants, a fine and costs of $175,000. It means he can't pass on his expertise to other GPs. It feels disappointing because it's just part of what I want to do with the rest of my life. Instead, he's selling the practice. His patients have to go elsewhere. Oh, we can not say it. Uh, you know, um, oh, we can shame them. Oh, we can shame on them. His possessions packed away, but not his principles. I don't care about a legacy. <laughs> um, I just want to help people. He called me a success story. And, you know, and it's those things that he said to me that, you know, just keep me going, I think. What do you think of the stand he took? He's a hero to me. He's always, always, always has been. But a lot of people, <clears throat> sorry. A lot of people have um, looked to him at really like a father because very few people have necessarily had the understanding and the support around ADHD throughout their lives. And I guess for them, finally, they found someone who really did get their story. I just want to help people. I want to make a difference in people's lives. And I will continue, keep on trying to do that in my last breath. <laughs> well, Dr Han intends to appeal the medical tribunal's decision so he can work with other GPs in the event of a change to the system. And after more than two years waiting, Jesse is about to start ADHD medication and is excited to see what difference it might make for her.